Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. Okay, in this lesson, we are going to look at the title that Father gives God the Son, who is Jesus, when God the Son wants to be in the flesh. Okay, so... We're looking at the title, My Servant. We're looking at where it's found in the Bible, either My Servant or His Servant. But, here's the key. You have to have a version like the New King James Version, where it gets the capitalizations of servant right. Okay, I'm not trying to push the New King James Version on you. But this, this study is another great example of how you can differentiate between my messenger or my servant where the S and the M is not capitalized like Malachi for example the book of Malachi would be a good example where my messenger is talking about Elijah small m but then messenger of the covenant capital M is talking about Jesus this is why I love the New King James Version but that's not what this lesson is all about this lesson is not just about the title that God gives his son, God the Son. We know him as Jesus when he's in the flesh. He gives him the title, My Servant, and Father capitalizes the S. And you may say, well, the New King James Version folks did that. Well, let's see if you agree with me at the end of this lesson. Now, I, I kind of introduced you in the last video lesson that I did here on my YouTube channel um, when, uh, when I used the My Servant um, understanding to help you see that Isaiah chapter 50 are all red letters. It would be correct to call it like a red letter edition uh, of Isaiah chapter 50. It's the words of Jesus, who is God the Son. Now, some of you may say, well, I don't like making, I believe you, but I don't like making God the Son's uh, words read unless he's in the form of Jesus. Well, okay, I understand that. But I think it gives more understanding if we do take the words of God the Son, who is Jesus, when he wants to be in the flesh, Make those red too, as long as you're sure that it's him that's talking. What is wrong with that? And uh, but, but the beauty of this lesson about the study of the title, My Servant, capital S, found in the New King James Version, which is Father, uh, one of his titles for his son, God the Son, is you actually see father giving jesus who is god the father excuse me god the son you see jesus being given two missions god the son is given two missions by his father for example if, if you were in a sunday school class and your sunday school teacher posed the question to you what's the mission of jesus christ how would you answer it would you get it right and just maybe word it a different way? Or would you leave out his first mission? And you might say, what do you mean, brother? Well, Jesus, you're seeing this lesson that Jesus is actually given two missions. He's given mission one and he's given mission two. Now, I'm not trying to say that mission two is less important than mission one. But we should take notice of which one is mentioned first. And it's interesting because these, the people that this first mission concerns are the people who are the natural branches on the tree of life that Jesus is the root of. So let's not deny that. And then the adopted sons and daughters are involved in the second mission of Jesus. And you may say, well, this is the, mission, the two missions of God the Son, not Jesus. Yeah, they're the same. Okay, don't, don't even go down that route. If it's the mission of God the Son, it's the mission of Jesus in regards to the Earth, the planet Earth. Now, he may have missions outside, you know, our galaxy. He may have a million miss missions. 
but involving planet Earth and mankind, these are Jesus' two missions. So if you were posed that question in Sunday school class or in a small group, um, this is how you would answer that question correctly. And again, when you get those questions like that answered correctly, then it gives you better understanding about what the millennium is all about. It gives you better understanding of Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. It gives you better understanding of what's mentioned in Malachi chapter 3 about the millennium. Yes, the millennium is spoken of in Malachi 3. And of course we see the time of Jacob's trouble mentioned in Malachi 4. Hallelujah. Now, brothers and sisters, it may seem sometimes like I am trying to train you up, not just to be um, people of understanding about the 70th week of Daniel, which I am, but sometimes, if you've studied with me, it may seem like I'm trying to teach you to become shepherds. And the answer is, I am. But I, have, I am someone who has never been a shepherd. I'm someone who has not graduated the seminary. So what's my point? Well, my point is um, churches, uh, as traditional churches as we know them, are about to be done away with. Say, brother, I knew you were working for the evil one. What are you trying to, to push on us now? Well, my point is this. Just like what we see in a lot of countries overseas, where Christians are forced to hide and worship and teach each other in the homes underground churches if you will well that's what's going to eventually someday happen in america in england and australia and south africa and canada you, you get my point and there's some there's pros and cons to that but there's also a lot of pros to that right we find out who the real christians are but my point is, when that day comes, you can be a shepherd, you can be someone who teaches the Word of God and have no seminary training whatsoever. So yeah, in a sense, I am training you up to be shepherds, even though I have never been one. But you're going to be a special shepherd. You're going to be the shepherd when the church has to go into hiding. Okay, You're going to have the answers to uh, most of the questions that people in these little small groups, in these little churches that are hidden and, and, and can only teach inside the houses, okay? And you may even have to uh, go out into the wilderness in tents and teach this understanding. All right, so what are the two missions that Father has for Jesus, God the Son, and where can we find these titles where Father is addressing His Son as My Servant, capital S. And there's a couple where it's His Servant, capital S. And you may say, not to pick on the King James Version, it's my second favorite, but you won't see the S capitalized in the King James Version. And you may say, well, that's great that the New King James Version does that, providing that it's 100% correct. Well, I can tell you from my studies over the last seven years of the 70th week of Daniel, I've never noticed a verse where they got it wrong. That's, that's the best thing I can tell you. All right, here we go. The study of my servant, two missions of Jesus Christ. These are most of the passages in the Holy Bible that refer to God the Son, who we know as Jesus, our example. All right, in that way. Uh, the first one I have for you is Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13 through 15. Behold, my servant, again the S is capitalized, shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him, for what had not been told they shall see with their own eyes, and what they had not heard they shall consider. So 
This is referring to Jesus coming a second time, but it also refers to uh, the torture that he went through so he can shed his blood for our sins. Okay, so it talks about his first coming and talks about Jesus' second coming and how they shall look up and see the face of him who sits on the throne and they shall, uh, be, they shall not speak and they'll be in awe at his presence, at his appearance, at his second coming just before they are judged by him. But he shall sprinkle his blood all right, on many nations. In other words, many people, many Gentiles all throughout the earth will beg for the opportunity to have Jesus' blood sprinkle on them and atone for their for their sins okay through faith hallelujah so um, again I love the New King James version here there's no doubt that the my servant is referring to Jesus God the Son in the flesh hallelujah right there in Isaiah 52. Now that you, and again, this is kind of giving witness that my understanding of Isaiah 50, I did in the last lesson, how I made those red letters. This is witness to that, that that was correct. I had permission by Almighty God to do that. And that's, that's what this, uh, one of the purposes of this lesson, to show you that what I did and addressing the Isaiah 50 as red letters, it was, was permitted, was correct, was the truth. Here we are in the New Testament, Matthew 12, verse 18, New Testament giving witness to the Old Testament. Behold, my servant, okay, the first three words start out identical for a reason. That's exactly what Father's doing. And the fact that the Holy Spirit gave me Matthew 12 as the second verse, and he gave me Isaiah 52 as the first verse, as I was forming this PNG file, whether you believe it or not, is a witness that the Holy Spirit is teaching me and is showing me these things and helping me put these PNG files together. And I don't say that because I'm asking for money. I don't ask for money, if you've noticed. Okay? I'm not even trying to write a book. Maybe someday I will. But I, I serve the Lord because I know when the Paymaster comes, capital P, I'll get paid. Do you see what I'm what I mean by that? I'll, I'll get paid a billion times more than I'm worth when I translate it into an immortal body and to to be loved by him for eternity. Okay? What more could you ask for? But you see that he's helping me put these studies together to teach you. And I get blessed by it. You think I didn't almost jump out of my seat when he gave me Matthew 12 after Isaiah 52? I was like, oh, here we go, Lord. You're, you're wanting this to be something special. Okay, hallelujah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. And you see, brother, why I recommend the New King James Version so much. Because once you read the Bible with this version of the Bible, it's hard to go back. It really is. It's hard to go back to just, Behold my servant, small s, in whom I have chosen, my beloved, small b. It's, it, it's just hard to go back. Once you've seen it like this, and, and God has given witness that he's happy with the New King James Version. My spirit upon him. What's the green, Father? What's the, the pinkish color? Jesus, God the Son. And he will declare justice to the Gentiles. Is that one of the missions of Jesus? Yes. Is it his first mission? No. And why do you say that? Because when we get down here uh, to Isaiah 49, we'll see the two missions and which one he lists first. I'm not saying they're not co-equal. I'm not saying that, but it's interesting which one he lists first. But yes, Matthew 12 is just giving you witness and more understanding of Isaiah 49. Zechariah 3, verse 8, that's that famous passage, all right, that's talking about, oh, never mind, I was confusing that with Zephaniah 3, 8, which is 
wait on me. Jesus telling you how long you have to wait on him. Wait on me until the day I rise up for plunder. At the Talking about the battle of the great day of God Almighty at the pouring of the seventh bowl. When you read that, behold, I am coming as a thief in Revelation 16. I am coming quickly. But this is not Zephaniah 3.8. This is Zechariah 3.8. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. This behold, um, I hope you'll check out my study called Behold, of all the beholds in the New King James Version that are in reference to Jesus being brought forth. I hope you'll check it out. And it really explains the behold in Revelation 16, 15. Everyone wants to know, when do I get my rapture? When's the resurrection? When in Revelation does Jesus come? Which seal, trumpet, or bowl? Everybody wants to know. Well, the study of the behold, my servant, uh, that I have in a Word document form for you, uh, using the New King James Version shows all of the matches to Revelation 16, 15 found in the entire Old and New Testament, referring to the pouring of the seventh bowl, appearing of the my servant as king of kings. Hallelujah. I hope you'll check it out. Behold, I, I as Father talking, and bringing forth my servant, capital S, the branch. Okay, this is talking about Jesus. But it's God the Son. But of course, at his second coming, he comes uh, as Jesus, but in a glorified state, transfigured state, full of power. Hallelujah. Isaiah 53, 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant, this is Father talking about his son, shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Is there any doubt that we're talking about Jesus, God the Son in the flesh? This is Father telling you all the wonderful things that his Son is going to achieve. Now here we go. Here's the correct answer to the question. Um, if you were ever asked, why did Father send God the Son and put and 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 make him a man for thirty three years, right? What, in other words, what's the purpose of God the Son coming in the flesh as Jesus Christ of Nazareth? What was his mission, or does he have more than one mission? But it's answered here in Isaiah forty nine six. Indeed, he Father says it is too small a thing that you talking about his son should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. Okay, that's all together. That's mission one. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That's the two purposes, or the two uh, purposes for God the Son coming as Jesus, or you could say the two purposes, two missions of Jesus. That's it. Did you know that? It explains a lot. Now you understand what the millennium is all about. You understand Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 that's never taught in church. Okay, you understand Malachi 3, 4. Right? Why Father is so concerned about the sons of Levi in their mortal bodies during the millennium offering pleasant sacrifices to him, Father, during the millennium. And again, things like that will help you understand uh, Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. Hallelujah. Isaiah 49, 5, And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. So Isaiah 49, 5 is talking about mission 1. But we know because of verse 6, which immediately follows, that I read first, 
there's actually two missions. But this is referring to mission one, where Matthew 12 is referring to mission two. See, so Matthew 12 is mission two. Isaiah 49, 5 is mission one. And then Isaiah 49, 6 gives you both missions. You got it? So if anyone only taught Matthew 12 and didn't teach Isaiah 49, 5, and 6, then they're not telling the whole story. And it's important that we tell the whole story, not to diminish Jesus' role in regards to his Gentile followers, right? Not because it's some kind of a pro-Israel push or agenda that's trying to, min to diminish Jesus' role amongst Gentile followers. No, that's not the reason why I stress these things, okay? Because you won't understand the millennium. You won't, and, and you'll end up like all of these shepherds who try to say that the Lord is done with the earth and we're going to the heavenly realm before the throne of God and we are not coming down here for a thousand years. There are a lot of shepherds that believe that. And if they understood Jesus' first mission, then they would understand this. And they would understand the millennium. And they would understand this, Malachi 3, 4. You got it? Why do you only want to understand half of the Bible? And half of the things that are about to take place? Why not understand it all? That's why Father put it in here, in your owner's manual. Okay? He put it in there. Don't be a lazy servant. Because you have this thing of, against Israel, you don't even like talking about mission one for Jesus. All right? Get over it. Teach the whole Bible. Isaiah 42, verse 1, the servant of the Lord. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, Another title given to Jesus by his father, the first of the elected ones, right? In whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Okay, that's mission two. All right. So 49.5 is mission one. 42.1 one is mission two. Matthew 12 is mission two of Jesus, but Isaiah 49, 6 gives you both. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you might say, why would Father in one verse only give us one of Jesus' two missions? That's a little confusing. He's adding confusion to his word. Why doesn't he just cut the number of verses down and just give us, you know, both, both missions in one verse and then leave it at that? so we don't go down the wrong path. I love the, I, I don't know how to answer that other than I love the way that he's presenting this to us. He's causing you to have to keep going back to the garden to spend time with him. And you might say with God the Father, well, yeah, when you spend time with his spirit in the garden, the Holy Spirit, who's your counsel, who's your teacher, you get to hang out with him, and he gets to hang out with you, and he really enjoys that. And he loves the fact that the Bible's so long and has so many chapters and, and has so much information, but it's not all in one verse a lot of times, and you got to keep going back to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And he does that because just like you do with your children, you don't want them to come, you give them some information, and you never see them again. You want them to call up, maybe not every hour, but you want them to call up and not ask for money. Just say, hey, dad, I got a question. What do you think about this? Parents love that. Don't ask for money. Don't ask for things. Just call up and say, you know, I got a question. What do you think? Parents love to give their opinions. Grandparents love to give their opinions. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's end this lesson. This needs to be taught in Sunday school. It does. If you've ever sat in a Sunday school class and, and, and the subject of the millennium or the second coming of Jesus or the 70th week of Daniel has ever come up, everyone in the class, to include the teacher, 
99% of the time, you know I'm telling the truth, will quickly change the subject because they don't have a clue what's about to happen. They don't have a clue what's going to happen during the millennium and why. And they couldn't answer those questions. And that's why churches send out in mass the printed form of Bible study. Right? Okay, on this Sunday, you need to look at these verses in this chapter and answer these questions. I'm sorry, what a boring way to study the Bible, and it teaches you nothing about the future. Nothing. I'm not trying to discourage you from going to church, it sounds like it. Just the opposite. I want you to go to church. But I want you to be knowledgeable, and I want you to go to your Sunday school teacher and try to help them. But at some point, they're going to see that you know more about the future than they do. And if you have a good Sunday school teacher, even if he's older than you, all right, he'll want you to take over, but with his guidance and his mentorship. But he'll want you to take over. He'll see that you really do have an understanding of the 70th week of Daniel and the millennium. And if he's a good Sunday school teacher, he won't mind. And the shepherd, the pastor of the church, should sit in and see that, okay, you know what you're talking about. You've been trained by the Holy Spirit or trained by one who has been trained by the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'm going to bless off on this. And maybe it's not during the Sunday school lesson. Maybe it's on Wednesday nights. The pastor should say or the Sunday school teacher should say, okay. We're going to let you try it for a while. Wednesday night is yours. Let's talk about the 70th week of Daniel and the millennium, you know. And then when you say Jesus has two missions, they should not get upset and then cut you off and say, take the mic, you're done. Sorry. Love you. But uh, no, we're not having any of that here. It might upset our mother church (laughs) where all the funds come from. I'm sorry, brothers and sisters, but it really upsets me, as you can tell, that the 70th week of Daniel and the millennium are not taught at all in church, and most of the time when they are taught, it's taught wrong. And it's it, we're so close to starting the 70th week of Daniel, uh, it, it's going to be, in some ways, it's going to be a really good thing when Father orchestrates events so that we are forced to shut down all traditional churches, I hate to say it, and go to small groups because there's going to be a revival like you ain't ever seen and there's going to be uh, the 70th week and the millennium taught finally and it's going to be a beautiful thing to see the understanding in the eyes of the church finally and there's going to be a lot of bad that comes with that so you got to be careful what you wish for but there'll be some beauty in it All right, what needs to be taught in church, in Sunday school, Wednesday nights, all the above? Jesus, God the Son in the flesh, has two missions, and they explain what the millennium is all about. Mission one, I'm combining everything above. Mission one, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring Jacob back to God the Father, so that Israel is gathered to Father. Jesus shall also restore the preserved ones of Israel. That's Jesus' first mission. I didn't say that. Almighty God said that. Do you hear me? And you might say, well, that's not what Matthew 12 says you got to read the whole Bible. Father wants you to put, Father, I'm telling you, the author of the Old Testament is the author of the New Testament. You got it? Put them together. That's what they're meant to be. They're meant to be put together to get the whole truth. To raise up the tribes of Jacob. When does that happen? At the pouring of the seventh bowl, when Jesus arises brought by his father on the chair of Ezekiel 1, sitting at the right hand of his father above the wedding hall. He appears with all of his angels. Then we are taken to the barn. Bam! 
That's the exceedingly great army that stands on its feet in Ezekiel 37, three chapters before Ezekiel chapter 40. That's what happens. Okay. Now, what about uh, the tribes of Jacob who have uh, betrayed Jesus and, and Father Yah and taken the mark of the beast? Well, they're going to be cut off of that tree. And here comes all of these adopted Gentile followers of Jesus to be grafted onto that tree and to follow the Lord as he tramples and threshes the winepress and threshing floors throughout the battle of the great day of God Almighty throughout the Middle East, and he will punish the world for its evil. Okay. Jesus shall bring Jacob back. That's uh, in the Old Testament when you read in Isaiah about the Lord setting his hand to do a purpose the second time, phase two. All right. Or I should say phase two of the early days of the millennium. Phase one is the battle of the great day of God Almighty, releasing them from slavery. That one third that he refines and brings through the fire of Ezekiel 13. All right. And then, after the battle of the great day of God Almighty is over, Jesus and his angels and uh, the crusaders, if you will, the my mighty ones of Isaiah 13 who rejoice at his exaltation, Father Yah, here they come, bringing back the slaves, Jacob, from slavery. All right, that's what, and then to restore the preserved ones, to restore them to power, where they will actually serve Jesus as he's ruling over the planet as a very Jewish king, as a very Israeli king. Okay, stop thinking about Jesus separate from Israel. He's going to reign from Jerusalem as an Israeli king, as a Jewish king. Did you catch what I just said? Forever, starting with the thousand years of the millennium. Okay. Oh, you'd be surprised at the number of shepherds that don't like to say things like that. Now, what's Jesus' second mission? To serve as a light to the Gentiles throughout the earth and to bring forth justice and salvation to them. So mission one and mission two are my words that I got from these verses above. I've just combined them. And I don't see how you can dispute them based on what we just read. I don't see how you can dispute that. But I'm always curious of your understanding and would love to hear from you. Well, brothers and sisters, I hope this lesson on my servant, the two missions that Father has for Jesus, has been a blessing to you. I hope you share it with the brethren, print it out. I'll leave the link, and I uh, can't wait to see you next time. God bless.